Okay, so time to get started again with our last talk before lunch. So here we have uh, Orestes and Romanos. So um, I've heard that apart from writing Julia code, they also wave swords at each other from time and again. Um, but now we're not going to talk about swords, we're going to talk about space stuff. So yep. take it away. Okay. Okay, so hello, hi. Um, it's a great opportunity to be able to visit this country again. Um, before probably introducing ourselves, I'd like to say a few words on the outline of the talk that we're going to give you today. So, in essence, we're going to talk about how we've used and are using Julia in one of the first um, space missions uh, that are being developed in Greece, our home country. And uh, to do that, we'll first briefly give you some context of what exactly uh, it is that we're trying to do, and that's um, writing simulations to try and estimate and control the orientation of uh, nanosatellites. Okay. Um, then we'll move over to some high-level details of our mission and how these translate to simulation requirements. Uh, we'll then be able to see uh, a bit more in-depth how Julia has really helped us in this domain and how we think that uh, overall this is a domain uh, that has some gaps that Julia could very easily um, be adopted to fill them uh, to some uh, great effect. Um, We'll then see a short um, example, a case study, if you'd like, on how Julia has helped us uh, with the space mission. And I'll give a uh, summarizing uh, comment to wrap up the talk of uh, the current status of the Julia ecosystem uh, in regards to astrodynamics and space mission design. And um, we'd really like this talk to be an opportunity to spark some discussion about how we can collectively uh, come together and work so that we can uh, make Julia a bit better for people that are interested in uh, doing space and space mission design. Okay, so uh, let me grab my <laughs> remote. Okay, so uh, I'm Orestes. Uh, this is my friend and coworker uh, Romanos. Um, we're both uh, students nearing our graduation. I am a computer scientist. He's an electrical computer engineer. Um, we're employed in the space mission we're going to talk to you about today. Uh, I'm an RSC, he's a simulation engineer. And uh, we're also working on a space biology mission where I'm the science lead and Romanos is, uh, again, a simulation engineer responsible for what we're going to see today. Um, we're members of a team uh, called Space Dot. Um, that's been funded to uh, sort of help promote uh, aerospace in Greece and is characterized by a strong commitment to open source and open access science in general. Uh, this is a CubeSat right here. Uh, it's our oldest project. So it's a satellite that's been about five years in the making. Uh, it's being developed um, under the ages of a program of the European Space Agency. Um, it's being made to conduct space biology research. Um, it has a twofold goal. We uh, first wish to study how human-like cells um, adapt to uh, conditions prevalent in low Earth orbit. And um, we're, uh, ba we're basing our work on a series of NASA missions and using them kind of as our stepping stone to take it a step further and try to do what people already do, but uh, on a way higher throughput and uh, on a larger uh, time scale. Um, the secondary goal, let's say, of uh, building a CubeSat was to really get hands-on experience in space missions. And that came particularly in handy um, earlier this year, where a contract uh, was uh, signed between the European Space Agency and the Greek state. And that uh, contract was uh, signed so that uh, it can help boost the nascent uh, space, se space sector in Greece. Um, under the pretext of this program, there's uh, seven, a total of seven running projects that all have to do with nanosatellites. And firstly, our team undertook the development of one project uh, called Pixar, it's right here. Uh, it's a nanosatellite that aims to establish an optical communications link with our ground station, which are fancy words to really say that we wish it to be able to communicate using a laser instead of uh, radio frequencies. And that's something that uh, is 
both way more secure and it also allows for higher bandwidth when transmitting data. Um, then there's a second project uh, that we're going to talk to you about today, mainly. Um, it has to do with a, it's being developed by a consortium of uh, various Greek SMEs, uh, universities and the Greek Navy. And it is about a nanosatellite constellation this time. Uh, again, that we wish uh, them to be able to communicate using lasers, but now we also wish to have inter-satellite communication. And a few other things. Um, and this mission in particular um, places some very stringent, some very strict requirements on uh, how you should simulate, try and simulate exactly how to control and predict the orientation of the spacecraft. And I'll give, t give it over to my friend who's going to take it from here and uh, talk about this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Mm, you can hear me? Yeah. Uh, yeah. OK, so I'm Romanos. Nice to meet you all. Uh, as my colleague said, uh, attitude control is a very critical aspect of our mission uh, because of the stringent pointing requirement. So to give you an idea, we need about uh, 0 0.1 degrees uh, um, error when it comes to pointing uh, the satellite to uh, the other satellite because we need to do an intersite, uh, an intersatellite optical link. And uh, in case it's not very clear, when we're talking about attitude, we mean the satellite orientation, basically where it faces. Uh, so let's see in more general terms uh, why control, uh, why attitude control is needed for a satellite. Uh, we need to keep the, the spacecraft uh, safe because if uh, the angular velocity of the satellite reaches a critical point, uh, beyond that we may not be able to control it, we may lose all uh, access to it. And so we need to keep it down. Uh, that's quite easy. Uh, harder even is to uh, point it very accurately to a specific point. But also, uh, the second point why we need uh, satellite uh, control, uh, attitude control, excuse me, is uh, because we may need to uh, uh, maximize power generation by pointing our solar panels to the sun. Uh, especially in CubeSat uh, missions, our power budgets are very tight, so yeah, we need to also con control for that factor. And uh, we may also need to uh, use directional antennas uh, in order to achieve higher uh, uh, transfer rates. So we may also need, because uh, the antennas are directional, we need to point them to a specific uh, point, to our ground station. Uh, we may also need to capture some images, and in our case, as I said again and again, we need to point uh, to a very specific point uh, in, order, in order to achieve uh, the optical link that uh, we require. So, uh, okay, that's good. But how we actually control our attitude, uh, we need to first estimate it. And uh, the general idea of uh, estimating our attitude is that we need uh, pairs of vectors. We need a reference vector, for example, the magnetic field or the sun, and we need uh, the measurement from the satellite's point of view. So we need to find a rotation that takes us, that maps uh, the reference to the measurement. Uh, to do that uniquely, uh, we need actually two pairs of vectors, at least two. For example, uh, the magnetic field and the, the uh, position of the sun. Uh, the static approach, like the traditional approach that has been used, um, is to uh, estimate this attitude from scratch on each time step. Uh, this has uh, a few problems. The first problem is that we do not use uh, past information from different state, from uh, the past states, and also that in case we lose uh, a specific measurement, like the sun where we're in, a, in eclipse, uh, we lose total knowledge of our attitude, and this is not very good. So this is why uh, modern systems use recursive filters like uh, Kalman filters and so on. Uh, and this uh, solves those, both of those problems. We have more accurate estimation because we use uh, past information. And we also, uh, in case we lose a measurement, we do not freak out. For a medium amount of time, we can still uh, keep estimating our attitude. Yep. I keep coming back to this because you'll see why. <laughs> So uh, the governing law of our system is Euler's equation for rigid body dynamics. Uh, I is the inertia matrix. Uh, it's the, a matrix that contains information about uh, moments of inertia. Uh, omega is the angular velocity of the satellite. And M is the moment or the total torque applied on the satellite. Uh, those kinds of systems are usually controlled using uh, uh, regular feedback controllers. Uh, including a quaternion and uh, angular velocity part. For those who don't know, a quaternion is an algebraic way to um, uh, represent rotations mathematically. Uh, 
Uh, typical uh, CubeSat actuators include magnet orkers and reaction wheels, which is what we use. We don't really use thrusters because those are quite expensive and do not usually fit in the, in the budgets. Uh, now, those actuators uh, include internal dynamics, unfortunately, which need to be simulated. And uh, they also suffer from uh, saturation, like we do not uh, have the capability to give infinite torque. Uh, now, uh, this, uh, this um, the internal dynamics uh, com together with uh, the saturation of uh, uh, the actuators and combined with the fact that our system is non-linear and its uh, dynamics may actually change throughout the orbit because, for example, the magnet uh, uh, performance are dependent on the magnetic field of the Earth and that changes throughout the orbit. This means that even the dynamics of our system is not stable. Uh, not stable, is not uh, consistent. Which means that we cannot really use the classic tools of uh, control theory uh, to uh, analyze our system theoretically. So, uh, if we combine this with the fact that uh, our system cannot really be tested adequately on Earth, it needs to be on space, uh, we can only do very minimal tests on Earth, uh, this leaves that uh, computation as the only avenue to acquire um, qualitative insight into our, uh, our system. Uh, so, as I said, because we do not have uh, theoretical tools to analyze all this, uh, we need to tune uh, our filters and our uh, controllers in some way, and uh, uh, we need to do this computationally, or worse, by hand, which is what has been traditionally done so far. Um, and this is why we think that uh, performance is very important in those kinds of simulations. We do not really have uh, gradient information, so we can't use... Uh, gradient descent or that kind of uh, algorithms. We need to use black box stuff, unfortunately. Uh, and uh, we need fast iterations on the simulation, which is not very compatible with the fact that those simulations tend to be quite complex. Um, so this is why we think uh, we need a tool that can uh, at the same time be uh, fast to develop in and also uh, not require a lot of explicit optimization on our side. Okay, so. In general, uh, we need a simulation such, um, okay. Because our project is quite fast track and small scale, we don't have a very large budget, uh, both in time and cost. Uh, we need to have a simulation that can adapt as we learn about our system, because we're doing the development uh, and the simulation at the same time. Uh, and so we need a structure that can be, be easy to change. Uh, and the, the actual dynamics that we simulate may also change as we understand more about our system. So we, we, don't, we can't really use a, um, a static tool like C++ or something like that. Uh, but we also need it to be performant. Uh, and uh, this combination is what uh, we think uh, gives Julia the edge in such a case. Okay, so uh, I'll name drop a few packages that we've used. Uh, we're using for the space stuff, satellite dynamics, and satellite toolbox, and uh, we're hoping to integrate uh, our uh, simulation with DFQ. And uh, um, we also include some custom functionality about uh, attitude estimation, about sensor availability, uh, actuator modeling, uh, dynamics, and so on, and also we include the pointing controller. What I think is important to state here uh, is that uh, we have a lot of interlocking parts, a lot of uh, parts that are uh, inherently codependent and need to be simulated coupled, uh, which if we use something that is more modular and is forced to be more modular, maybe then we couldn't get the job done. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah, go on. Okay, so um, ignoring Julia, um, the usual approaches for this kind of problem uh, is using turnkey simulation tools which is was what is mostly used by engineers in, in the specific sector because they're not really very code savvy, they're not developers by trade, uh, they just use code as a way to get their job done. So um, when you, you talk about those tools, you have to take into account that they're not a very technical uh, audience in, in this specific sector. Uh, so the problem with using uh, turnkey tools is that you can't really customize the behavior, uh, the configuration is very limited, and uh, if you went with a, a modular plugins, uh, predefined plugins architecture, the thing is that it enforces modularity and you have to uh, combine everything into a single interface, uh, which is not very, I mean, you can do it, but it's not very accurate for uh, the kinds of interdependent uh, modeling that we want to, to do. 
And of course, the third option is to use multiple different tools. You could use Python with MATLAB with uh, standard simulation tools to um, try to do something more um, flexible. But the trouble with this is that there's a lot of moving parts. Uh, the interface can be challenging. You, you need to maintain a lot of packages. And uh, it can also be quite slow. Uh, so I'll okay, yeah. right. So um, we've seen uh, what it is we're trying to do, and uh, we've also seen what the uh, traditional approaches to solving these problems are, and how uh, they're not necessarily the most optimal fit for what we're trying to achieve. So we believe that Julia can fill a great role in this space sector, and I'd like to uh, explain both where exactly and why. Um, First of all, there's institutional space, so very uh, large-scale spa space missions. Uh, as a whole, it's, a, it's an industry that's extremely inflexible, uh, where there is uh, correctness is a must, uh, you have to abide by a lot of uh, procedures and standards, and generally there's practically almost zero room for adapting uh, more new and agile methodologies. Uh, on the other hand, that's not the case with new space, um, which is an emergent trend uh, that has gained a lot of momentum recently and that uh, has to do with more small-scale uh, space missions which happen uh, to usually be uh, space missions that involve nanosatellites. Um, now, why exactly is uh, Julia important here? Well, this is a domain where there's no really a de facto uh, programming language that's being used and that Julia will somehow have to dethrone uh, to take its place, per se. Um, people have a tendency to use old legacy tools instead of relying on coding the simulations using uh, programming languages. Um, this in turn means that these tools uh, often come with high procurement costs, um, which is in contrast to the relatively low budget that's available. And there is also some uh, back and forth needed. You have to sign NDAs. You have to talk with the companies before you buy the product. You have to have them uh, pay extra for some simulations, do a back and forth, um, pay extra for engineering support, and so on. Uh, so a lot of costs here. And also there is this uh, hidden cost of uh, tool helping, let's say, in an organization that deals with these kinds of things. Uh, so you have uh, engineers that are being trained to uh, familiarize themselves with a specific technology and acquire a skill set that's not necessarily uh, very transferable. Um, as a minor uh, segue and as a sh short uh, testament to uh, our stance that Julia can prove quite useful here, um, we're actually about to be uh, employed to work on another one of these ESA projects uh, where they have to uh, do some simulations in order to uh, move on to the next uh, phase of their mission and both the project people and ESA agreed that uh, us coding the simulations in Julia was the uh, best approach, so there's that. Um, now let's get into uh, a bit uh, on the more technical side of things. Um, as you've probably heard you know, a million times over, uh, there's a, we believe there's a two-language problem in this domain as well, and uh, Julia can uh, help solve it. So, uh, for example, there's a tool developed by ESA called PyCap that is in pure Python, but all the uh, performance-intensive algorithms are actually in C++, and they use uh, the Python module for Boost from Boost to interface with that. Um, Julia solves this problem. Uh, Julia offers great interfacing capabilities, both with C and Fortran through the FFIs, uh, which is very important because, for example, in, in C you have uh, these collections of uh, various um, algorithms that are being used throughout the, the industry, and it's very easy to write wrappers for these in Julia. And for example, there's a lot of uh, models, atmosphere models, for example, that are in Fortran. And so being able to directly uh, access them and uh, talk to them uh, is something that's very important. Um, Julia is performant out of the box. I know there's a talk that's saying that Julia is creating this 1.5 language problem and so on, but I'm, the reason I'm emphasizing out of the box here is that uh, these are, again, um, missions where A, the people working on them aren't that seasoned necessarily, and B, the uh, timescales are very small. Uh, so having uh, the ability to work with a tool that allows you to have some performance uh, increase right from the get-go, uh, we believe it's very important to be able to 
uh, A, deliver what you have to deliver in time, and B, uh, do some quality work. Um, when the time comes that you have to do some optimizations, uh, our experience uh, was that Julia is very easy to optimize in the broader sense. Uh, for example, there are some great tools uh, like Jet and Snoop Compile and how it can be used for uh, cache, uh, for invalidations, and so on and so forth. And I think that also um, the fact that Julia uh, is uh, being developed and maintained by a community that somewhat focuses on scientific computing uh, really means you have direct access to uh, resources that can further help you uh, get the speed that you need out of this. Um, and lastly, on that note, um, in these kinds of simulations, uh, the, what you have is, on the one hand, you have some very large uh, data structures that are often models, complex models that you use, and then you have some very small uh, custom objects that you have to pass around frequently and uh, do a lot of operations on. And uh, particularly, the fact that you can use Julia to turn these operations uh, basically allocation-free most of the time is, uh, I think, a uh, very significant uh, contributor to uh, performance gains. And again, um, there is also a uh, very easy option to hack into the broadcast tiles and uh, have some uh, operations for your custom objects that are uh, able to fuse into very efficient uh, kernels. Um, now, that's the uh, side of Julia Advantages that's mostly focused on uh, performance. And I have another slide uh, that's focused on development, flexibility, and overall ease of use. Uh, so first and foremost, um, we shouldn't neglect that Julia is an open source language. And it being an open source language uh, means it's very easy. It invites collaboration, and it is uh, a tool that's very easy to integrate uh, in a project, uh, both in research and in industry. Um, uh, it comes with a smooth learning curve, and I think it is a smooth uh, learning curve throughout one's experience with uh, Julia. Uh, there's a lot of people that uh, aren't necessarily, don't, don't necessarily have a strong background in uh, the software engineering side of things, and they're able to pick this up and uh, learn as they go. And uh, Julia allows us to bridge the gap and bring the groups of uh, software engineers and simulation engineers together, as was highlighted in the talk earlier. Um, Third-party packages are very easy to modify and or extend. Uh, that's owing to some key Julia features. And um, it is a different case, say, with uh, Python, where you have people that are not very necessarily very uh, familiar with uh, uh, software development. And when the time comes to modify a uh, third-party module, they find that uh, the author is doing some very arcane things in order to squeeze out some performance out of it, and they're pretty much stuck. Uh, and that's not a problem that you f typically face in Julia. Um, and lastly, you know, multiple dispatch, uh, user-defined ADDs, it's a wonderful pattern to work with. And because these are simulations where uh, there's often the need to uh, define your own custom objects, uh, being able to do this uh, through this pattern is very easy and fast. Okay, I'm going to pass it over to Ramanas final time to talk about a specific case study of how Julia helped us. Yep. Hello again. Um, now, we've had a very large problem, uh, as I said before, about the, with the Eclipse. And uh, in uh, the Cube submission, it was the first satellite that was mentioned. Um, uh, we only use two uh, sensors. We use a magnetometer and a sun sensor to determine uh, our attitude, uh, which means that when uh, inside Eclipse, we lose one measurement, we lose the sun uh, vector, and, uh, well, the attitude estimation is carried out uh, using a Kalman filter. It fuses the, uh, the two measurements into one specific uh, uh, orientation. Uh, so the trouble was that uh, we lost very, uh, very quickly after entering Eclipse, we lost uh, our estimation. What, means, what th does that mean? It means that uh, our error rose so high that it was practically useless. Uh, and so we, we tried uh, tuning the filter. Uh, because that is what we were told. We tried uh, doing it uh, with a genetic algorithm on uh, MATLAB simulations, which were incidentally not very performant, as I'm sure you know. Um, and we were unsure, uh, essentially, if there was a problem with our design choice, like uh, uh, the choice of the, of the sensors, of the sun vector. Is this something intrinsic, or can we, uh, with some tuning, fix it? Uh, so we threw a Hail Mary, 
what we did was to uh, rewrite the simulation, well, a lightweight version of it in Julia, and uh, try to optimize it with OptimJL, and uh, voila, it worked. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so we were very happy about that, and we think uh, Julia uh, specifically helped us uh, in a multitude of ways. First of all, uh, it was very easy to write uh, a new simulation in it because it's dynamic. It's also, as we said, performant out of the box, so we didn't need to put a lot of um, effort into optimizing it. And finally, uh, this hasn't, doesn't have to do with Julia itself, but uh, OptimJL uh, was a very useful tool in this because um, it helps us use the appropriate algorithms to do this with a, a, a small amount of iterations. Uh, so yeah, we uh, we actually managed to tune it. And what's important here, I think, is that uh, the gains in performance actually um, leads us to uh, explore a larger part of the search space. So we actually uh, gain more um, qualitative insight. So it's um, a point where the computational difference makes a qualitative difference, which we think is uh, very important with uh, those kinds of topics. And uh, case in point uh, is another uh, example here that uh, is a part of a general phenomenon, which we think is that uh, when simulations become much more performant, which Julia helps a lot with this, uh, so we gain more, uh, a larger, a better view of the search space, and we can actually understand more things about uh, our systems, which, as I said, because they're real-world systems, they're not theoretical, and they have real-world limitations, we cannot really analyze with uh, the standard theoretical tools that we may learn in the university. Uh, yeah, so yep. that's it from me. Or uh, so the reason we selected this particular example was not only because uh, Julia will help, to sol help us uh, solve a major problem, but also because we think there's this uh, phenomenon that can be attributed to the performance Julia brings into the table and perhaps some other features of the language where you can, uh, through these simulations, you're allowed to uh, get a qualitative understanding of the underlying uh, mechanisms of the system you're trying to simulate. Uh, and this is a case study by, uh, published by Julia Hub a time ago where a company intern uh, said that, well, there was something we needed to do. We really didn't know it was even if it's even possible to do it in the first place. We used Julia. We, we were able to uh, have a major speed up and voila, we discovered a new approach we can take and it also, uh, that also led them into developing a new better product and all these sorts of things. Um, okay, to wrap up this talk, uh, a brief comment, let's say, uh, as an invitation mostly to, for discussion on the uh, current status of the Julia ecosystem uh, when pertaining to astrodynamics. Um, I did a small research when preparing for this to give this talk, and I found a very recent publication from uh, I think it was October 2023, uh, where some people uh, essentially showcased a toolbox they were um, building in Julia for space mission design, and this is a quote from the publication where they mention uh, that uh, there is definitely some room for improvement uh, when it comes to some of the Julia packages that are available uh, in this domain. And these are some of the problems we had to face uh, quite a lot in our own use case. Um, currently, as it stands, I'm sorry if I'm missing anything, uh, you have these five uh, organizations and tools. So there is Satellite Dynamics, which we're, we're using. There is Julia Space uh, with the staple, the Satellite Toolbox uh, package uh, that you might have seen in discourse from the, Brazilian, from the people in Brazil who launched a satellite using it. Uh, there is Julia Astro, there is uh, General Astrodynamics, which uh, as I'm under, uh, I am understanding it, it's undergoing a process where it's being split into atomic uh, sub-packages, so it's more of a, like an organization in the making. And there is lastly Julia Space Mission Design. Um, I've uh, put a link to a GitHub issue here. Um, when Satellite Dynamics uh, first went open source, the, the first issue that was created uh, on GitHub was from Ronin, uh, one of the creators of Satellite Toolbox, another package uh, where he e expressed the desire of uh, the people in the community coming together and uh, merging their efforts towards a common goal. Um, I'm not going to expand it, uh, a lot into this. Uh, there's some ideas. Feel free to reach out and discuss. For example, uh, we could hold a mini symposium related to astrodynamics in Julia if there's enough people interested in the following JuliaCon next year. Um, again, reach out. We, we'd love to talk about this uh, a little bit more. So that concludes uh, our talk for today. 
I'd like to thank you all for sticking with us through the end. Thank and you. if there's any questions, yeah, feel free to ask them. All right. Got any questions? Yep. Way in the back. Yeah, I'd be repeating the, the question. Okay, okay, no, uh, okay, the question was uh, if the code is going to be run on board the satellite, the answer, of course, is no. <laughs> uh, not yet, at least. Uh, uh, the emphasis of our talk is uh, more related to the design, uh, the earlier uh, phases of a space mission. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Uh, the thing is, is that with uh, these kinds of missions, uh, especially fast track missions, uh, most of the software running on the satellite is uh, uh, of the shelf. It's commercial, so we need to find a way to uh, emulate uh, the behavior of the the spacecraft without having access to the internal uh, things. And uh, this is the challenge. So yeah, we will not run. Uh, we would we will not run this on the spacecraft, but it's a great tool to to actually simulate the dynamics. Uh, I think I think Ronin from uh, Satellite Toolbox uh, mentioned this summer in Boston that uh, they were looking into ways to be able to uh, get a uh, Julia executable to one day be run on, on board, but don't quote me on this. Yep. But but there is um, it's it's not just about the uh, size the binary size. There's a lot of problems that I don't think uh, Julia is ready to face, and I don't think that. This is the focus of the community necessarily that's working on this. Yeah, and I also think that when it comes to um, spacecraft software, uh, you really need to focus on correctness and determinism. And I don't think that Julia is very appropriate for this uh, kind of job. Well, maybe not yeah. today, at least. Well, actually, this is the, <coughs> the biggest point of the, what they call it, embedding infrastructure. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, from uh, a point of view, we really are looking into determinism. Yeah, maybe you just uh, repeat what uh, Vangelos was saying here. So, um, yeah, so to sort of shortly summarize, um, at the SML, there's, uh, they're looking into actually getting Julia onto embedded systems, which is, yeah, has quite some similarities with yeah, the stuff with yeah, putting it onto a satellite and things like that. Maybe one last question. Okay. Or not. Maybe I can uh, uh, have one for myself. Um, I was actually wondering, how did you pitch this? How did you say yeah. like, okay, MATLAB isn't working, let's go for Julia. How did yeah. you manage um, to convince them? So uh, earlier this summer, I uh, attended some talks, for example, from people at Merck, and I asked the same question. And their answer was, well, we don't really speak about it that much. And <laughs> that's what we did. Um, people above in the hierarchy, let's say, uh, mostly care about the end result. So uh, if you manage to uh, not really get into the specifics of uh, how you're achieving what you're set out to achieve, uh, you can get around this, I think. At least in smaller scale uh, space missions. All right. So let's thank our speakers again. Thank you. <laughs>